uh, to wait for the last few people to come in. Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm um, John Garbett. I work for Citrix, and you know my job is working on getting the Zen server support really good inside uh, OpenStack and looking at uh, XCP and all sorts of other things. So in this session, um, uh, myself and I've got co-presenter um, Chris from Rackspace is going to do some talking as well and talk about how Rackspace actually use uh, Zen Server and OpenStack in their cloud. So I just want to go and give a you know sort of getting started guide to how you can look at deploying Zen Server and OpenStack, why you might want to do that. So before I start, I just want to get a quick idea of who's actually in the room. I can see you, obviously. <laughs> so first of all, I mean, who of you here considers yourself a uh, developer? Let's see. Okay, there's a couple of. And so who of you here is kind of has uh, actually deployed Zen Server and OpenStack already? Or tried it? Okay, cool. Um, and presumably the rest of you are at least interested vaguely. <laughs> that or you just need a seat, I don't know. So um, I guess the first thing to say is I'm a Citrix guy and I'm at an OpenStack conference. And this, this is good, <laughs> and this is for good reason. So if you look at what Citrix does with many of the other products uh, that we have, if you look at uh, Zen Server, uh, you know, it's used by lots of things and we want to get more people using it. I see my job as upstreaming Zen Server to OpenStack, and that's a very important part of what Citrix is doing. If you look at what Citrix is doing with the, uh, the Zen Desktop product, um, you know, VDI workloads, we support working with all sorts of hypervisors. Um, you know, from we actually supported Zen Server before we acquired Zen Server, and we supported Hyper-V at the same time when Hyper-V came out, and we support um, ESX and other things too, hopefully in the future. And you know, the fact that we're working on CloudStack doesn't preclude us working on OpenStack. You know, we, we think we think supporting what our customers want to do is really important. Whether that's for a full Citrix stack, you know, we're happy with that. And if, if there's other things that you want to use instead, we want to make sure that our products work really well with that. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on getting Zen Server and OpenStack working well. Okay, so I wanted to cover, you know, why use Zen, why care about Zen, and why care about Zen Server. And kind of uh, sort of going back from the history point of view, I mean, I'm based out of the Cambridge UK office, sat next to the Zen Server team, so I get to poke them with a stick if I've got any problems, which is great. Um, and I was, you know, I, I have to admit I'm biased. I, I did my degree at Cambridge University, which is exactly where Zen came out of. So I <laughs> thought I should declare that. <laughs> so when you look at Zen, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's, you know, in a lot of clouds today. It's in most clouds. Amazon use it. Um, Slicehost used it. Slicehost are acquired by Rackspace. They moved from open source Zen to Zen Server. You'll hear more about that later. Um, so Zen Server itself is a commercially supported product. You can get support on Zen Server. But we've, it, it, is full, it is fully open source, or at least mostly open source. And there's a fully open source version called uh, Zen Cloud Platform. Apologies for the name. Um, it's, that's kind of the open source Zen Server. And even today, you can get you know, the, the XCP packages and API available inside distributions like Ubuntu and things. We'll go on to a bit more of this later. And I kind of wanted to sort of say, Zen was kind of designed from the cloud to the outset. This is a very long quote. I basically pick, picked a random bit from a paper. I'll upload these slides if you want to read it later. Um, and it's kind of saying Zen was designed to run multiple untrusted workloads. And the Xeno service project was trying to create this wide sort of a global place in which you can buy and sell compute power, um, which sounds an awful lot like a public cloud. And that's why we think it works so well. So why use Zen today? Um, it's open source. Um, it's a really good large community behind it. Um, the community is really vibrant. I was here a month ago at uh, Zen Summit that was co-hosted with Cloud Platform. And for the first time in a long time, Zen Summit actually had two tracks. There were so many talks submitted, we just couldn't filter between them, um, which is good, because my talk was approved, so I got to spend some nice time in San Diego previously as well. And <laughs> I'll be honest, it's nice. Um, so it is, it is mature. It's cloud proven. It's been around a long time. The isolation properties are quite well known. Um, you know, the numbers of users, it's kind of hard to sort of predict these things. Um, the, 
the Zen sort of uh, community manager reckons there's at least 10 to 12 million open source users out there looking at people using it through CentOS and other, such others, other places. And I kind of wanted to point out something else. There's lots of people say, I don't want to use Zen because it, I have to use a special Linux kernel. Well, I don't know if you know, but there's an awful lot of work that's been done in the Zen community to push the Zen modifications uh, up into mainstream Linux. So from, well, it's actually some point at 2.6 world, but certainly from Linux 3.0, certainly Linux, you know, the 3.4 kernel, we've got the PVOps extensions in there. So Zen, the Zen extensions are actually part of Linux kernel. It's actually some quite cool code from the description I heard about it. And the other thing I wanted to sort of point out was it's about the isolation. These are two kind of like stupidly complex diagrams. And the only thing I really wanted to pull out here was that the idea of Zen is Zen is running on top of the hypervi on top of the hardware. It's a thin layer on top of the hardware. And that's the thing that's giving you the isolation between your VMs. Um, with other, and this is, this is called a type one hypervisor. It's worth saying Zen isn't a pure type one hypervisor because it's got this concept of the DOM zero, this privileged VM that has access to the hardware, and this allows us to leverage the drivers, standard Linux drivers for your hardware. So it means you get much better driver support for free, and it means Citrix don't spend all our lives writing drivers, which is a good thing. And you know, this, the alternative to this, or at least one alternative, is the type two hypervisor, where you, where you sort of got, in many cases, you're sort of using the whole Linux kernel and its power to give you the isolation, whereas Zen has a specific scheduler for doing kind of VM scheduling. It's a little bit of a different way of looking at things. So these, these isolation things seem quite cool. I just wanted to quickly point out, I just realized I've got loads of randomly complicated diagrams. I do apologize for that. It, it's kind of an eye chart. So I wanted to point out what some, some a Citrix product called Zen Client XT and what they've been doing there. They've been looking at how you can actually get really good isolation between your VMs. If that's the kind of thing you want to do, Zen's a really good thing to look at. Um, so in the future, what Citrix is looking at is this DOM zero piece. We can, we can split this up. So it means that per VM, um, you might have some emulated devices. And you can actually have isolated uh, units that are doing the emulation to, very s to separate exactly what your, uh, your VMs are doing. And the Zen client is basically looking at uh, you know, putting a hypervisor on your laptop and being able to have two different security zones kind of working on that laptop. So you have your secure VM and your sort of personal VM um, where you go on the internet and sort of making those things interoperate. So we're looking at sort of bringing this kind of technology. Um, the other things around here worth mentioning, there's some good work happening on trusted compute. We're not there yet. The future looks good. And there's some other work happening um, on uh, Neumann nodes to actually improve performance on really large machines. So disaggregating DOM zero means the, uh, well, getting a bit deep, but the shared memory pages can be on the correct MMU, basically. OK. So there's lots of, well, when you come in to get started with the Zen server and OpenStack, there's lots of terms flying around, and there's lots of terminology. So I kind of just wanted to give a kind of brief overview on some of this. Uh, one of the things that crops up is Zen API and what that is. Um, and you'll hear about the Zen API driver, which is the way that you access Zen server using OpenStack. So basically, um, it's, it's not that complicated. First of all, the, this engine, this thin layer that's on top of the hardware, that is Zen. That's open source Zen. That's the same open source Zen that's inside Zen server. What Zen server gives you on top is it gives you this package DOM zero with all the drivers and all the management tools. And part of that management tool stack is this Zen API. It's a remote um, protocol allowing you to manage this whole system. Um, I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, this was more just a picture for the developers. I wanted to kind of say Zen API is not that scary. The kind of thing it's doing is it's got concepts. Like it's got, you know, you've got VMs, you've got hosts, you've got, uh, you know, disks and SRs, groups of disks, you've got networks, and not really used in OpenStack that much, but you've got this concept of a pool of hosts. So it's not scary. Um, before I moved on, I kind of wanted to describe that there's a little bit of confusion between, you know, when you come to install Zen server, what can you install, what's free, what's open source. So 
the Zen Cloud Platform includes Zappy, includes Zen, and it's, it's basically got most of what's in the Zen commercial Zen server product. And this you can download from the Zen.org site. Um, the latest release is 1.6, which has got a similar set of features to the latest Zen server release of 6.1. Um, and you know, it's, it's a great product and worth working with. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to mention is that if you're interested in modifying this and building your own stack and from scratch, we're also looking at upstreaming this Zen API piece into lots of the distributions, so you can actually build your own custom DOM zero. So that's the kind of thing you've been doing with Zen before. Um, anyway, so that some of that's quite Zen specific for the people who are used to Zen. Um, I should probably ask actually, who of you here have used Zen before? Uh, sort of on other things. Okay, so that's that's a fair number. Um, so the next thing I wanted to do is, w so we've got this Zen API, we've got the We've got OpenStack. Um, I suppose I should say I'm kind of assuming a certain level of knowledge with OpenStack here, given that there's been the OpenStack 101 presentations and everything else. So when we combine all this, what does it look like? Um, it's so basically, what we've got is we've got the Zen hypervisor that you install on top of your system. When you install Zen Server and XCP, you get this package DOM0, which I was talking about, which is all the control piece looking after your hypervisor. And in there, um, when we're running OpenStack, there's some small modifications we make. We extend the Zen API to do specific things we need for OpenStack. And then on top of that, you install the VM, this DOM U. It's just a standard power virtualized VM. You can use Ubuntu, whatever you fancy. And in there is where your um, Nova services will, will run. So in the KVM case, you have your machine that's got KVM running, and on that same machine, you have all the KVM tool stacks and libvirt running, and you have all the Nova services running. The difference in the Zen server case right now is that we run all the Nova services in a VM. We sort of have them running there, um, not competing for resources with your domain zero, sort of isolated VM. And we use the Zen APIs um, remote capabilities to link these two things together. So here you've got, you know, you've got Zen running underneath, you've got the DOM zero, which is you know, very similar to your, what you would consider the hypervisor thing you're modifying in a, in a sort of KVM world. And in there you've got the tool stacks running and our extensions to the tool stack. And then we use the remote API with that VM on top. And I guess that's the key point for when you're getting started with, with the Zen server where you're actually installing the OpenStack packages from you know, whichever distro, that, that package install is happening in that uh, DOM U part, where number three is. It's not, and you, you're only doing a small modification to DOM zero as well. Um, kind of, there's, there's a slight separation there. Okay, how are we doing for time? Awfully. Um, th this diagram is kind of a, a terrible diagram, well, it's, it's a good diagram to get a, a good gist of what's going on. But the key thing is that the difference is really where Nova Compute is talking to the hypervisor, where that big circle is. And that's, instead of using libvirt and Zen, um, when you're using Zen server, you're using the Zen API driver, which then talks from that VM at the top down to the hypervisor underneath. Okay, so I've done lots of talking. So I thought doing a cool live demo so you can see me sweat would be a cool thing to do. So the, the latest version of um, Zen Server actually allows you to do some live migration without shared storage. So let's have a go. So first of all, um, so that didn't go awfully well. You can see bits of it. So what you can see here is I've got two Zen Server machines. Uh, named after things from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That's unimportant. <laughs> so on the, on the top machine, you can see we've got that control domain running, that's running the Nova services. On the second machine, you can also see the control domain, and you can see an instance that's sitting there. Instance number one. Very exciting. OK. Uh, just, to, just to point out, you know, when you're using um, 
this particular thing. You can see the, this is the instance here. This is, the horizon looks identical with Zen Server as it does with KVM. It's the same thing. It's the same OpenStack APIs. Uh, mostly when you talk to the APIs, it does exactly the same thing. Where it doesn't, please raise a bug and we need to fix it. But generally speaking, it does exactly the same thing. And unfortunately, this feature doesn't actually have a GUI yet. Although it seems traditional now to bring up command line windows in demos for some reason. So what we've got here is it's just listed. This, is, this particular instance has a GUI. Um, and if I look back in my history, the one I typed previously, uh, so all this is saying is it's saying for this particular instance, do a live migration and do a, uh, a block migration and move it to the host that has the name uh, stack OSW. Hopefully that doesn't error out. If I move this out of the way, you can actually see that the icon has changed to sort of like a transferring. We should actually see the VM move. I should probably uh, have a quick look at the console for this. So we can actually see that the VM is doing a very important job here. It's running a very important while loop that's been running since this morning when I last tested it. And you can see that the instance is starting to appear. And it switches hypervisors. What's happened there is that we've actually sunk, we, the, the local disk is running on, a, well, the disk of that instance was running on the, uh, the local hypervisor's disk, and that there's been some, while the VM was running, we took a snapshot seamlessly in the background and transferred the whole disk to the host. Once that was complete, well, while that's happening, we synchronously mirror the snapshot between the two hosts. There's a slight performance impact at that point. And once it's all complete, we do the standard Zen server live migration of moving the, uh, the memory between those two things. And hopefully, if we look over at the console, we can see that the, uh, that task is still busily working away. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. So, hopefully, I can actually work out how to get rid of these windows. gone away. Awesome. Okay. Sick. <laughs> Clickers seem to be doing this. Okay, so how can I get started? I just wanted to give you like a quick sort of if you want to go and have a play with this, I do recommend it. In terms of support, I do try and listen to all the mailing lists and get back to people as soon as possible. There's quite a few of us on the mailing list sort of to help you out. Um, that's, that's great. So the first one is for developers. Um, developers today, if you want to get like a, a really quick up and running, DevStack's a good way to go, and that works well with a Zen server. If you look, that's a very long URL. Basically, if you look at the readme at the top, it sends you to a Zen server-specific readme and it allows you to run a script that creates that power virtualized VM from you doing a network boot of Ubuntu and slurps all the uh, code straight from GitHub in there and you're away doing normal dev stack kind of things. And that's all good. So, sort of running out of time, but I just want to skip over this briefly. Uh, the general thing I wanted to say is when you're trying to get started with this stuff, the key things are you install Zen server, you install that VM on top, and inside that VM you install OpenStack. And that installing of OpenStack on top is pretty standard. You just install the packages. When you're installing the Zen server, uh, s setting up the networking for clouds is notoriously hard. Once you've got that clear in your head, you can get the VM correctly configured. And the VM, so you've got the VM networks, your management networks, your public networks, or you combine some of those. Inside the Zen server, there's the, the plugins that you need to install. Um, there's, there's the uh, installation guide is getting there. The installation guide should cover most of this stuff and tell you exactly how each step works. 
but just to give you an overview. And there's a few other bits and pieces too, which um, hopefully we can get this into a sub pack pretty so sharpish, so it's all automated. Um, I'm talking about these things and how you do them manually, but of course you want to use kind of DevOps tools when you're doing this for real, and the Puppet and Chef recipes should be there to help you. So the next step is the dev stack OS DOM U. You install the power virtualized VM, you know, standard mach um, virtual machine, and it's the usual kind of things. You install an overcompute, install, and you configure an overcompute. And creating images is kind of very similar to ev everything else. You create the VM, if you create the VM and Zen server, you can then, you know, you install the agent, you prepare it in the way that you want, and then you simply, you, you, well, you, the two things that are mostly supported are uploading VHD files, it's actually a, a slight kind of OVS style packaging, so a gzip um, VHD file up to glance, or, and then we also support raw. Um, these things are covered in the manuals. If they're, if they're at all unclear, do, do ask. Don't assume it's just an, you know, people will get back to you. We're trying our best to update this stuff and get it, make it really easy to use. So I kind of wanted to give some very quick configuration tips just to sort of make it so it's not too scary when you come and try and do this thing. So when you're trying to turn on Zen API, it's not the default driver, so you have to tell it to use Zen API. When you tell it to use Zen API, I said we're using this remote um, configuration thing. So when you're using Zen Center and you connect to your Zen server, you need to give it a connection URL, a username, and a password. Exactly the same when you're configuring OpenStack. You just need to tell it how to talk to Zen API. Nothing too scary. The networking, it's a little bit different. So I just wanted to very quickly sort of say, you've got things, I mean, the docs do cover this, but one thing I wanted to say is that you need to be clear on uh, what values are plugging into there. Because you can see here that Zen server has names of networks. So your Zen server has networks like ZenBR 0, ZenBR 1, Zappy 0, Zappy 1. Uh, so the flat network bridge is, can, is telling OpenStack which net Zen server network your VMs are getting connected to. So it turns out that's the thing that the ETH0 and the tenant VM is connected to, and that's probably in this case is ZenBR1. Um, when you're talking about other things, they may actually be talking about the interfaces inside the DOMU. So for the flat interface, you say, I want to connect my DNS mask that's giving me out the DHCP addresses to the interface that's in the DOMU. And the, similarly, for the public network, you're saying my floating IP addresses are going out of D3, which is referring to the D3 in that VM. This particular picture is actually what DevStack tries to, uh, well, DevStack will set up for you with these four interfaces. That was kind of a summary of it. So where can I find out more? I think I kind of said that before. You know, please ask questions if you get stuck. We'll do our best to help. Ask on the mailing lists. The documentation is getting there. To do getting started doc, that was for me to fill in if I actually got it submitted in time. I haven't, I should get, well, <laughs> I haven't yet submitted that properly. Um, that's a to do, so it's sort of partly an apology. <laughs> uh, we need to, so that I want to make sure it's nice and easy to get going with all the packages and get that docs there. They're almost there. And there's good stuff on the wiki. Okay, so that's all from me for now. Um, we'll, get, we'll sort of go skip to the questions at the end. I'll hand over to, uh, to Chris. Have a clicky thing. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Behrens. I work for Rackspace. I'm a senior software developer there, um, obviously working on OpenStack. So I'm going to talk a bit about how uh, we use Zen Server um, and uh, kind of what scale we use it and try to help John promote, get people, more people using Zen Server with OpenStack. So I'm gonna give a little bit of background on uh, cloud servers first, the group that I work in. Um, it is the public cloud side of Rackspace, and uh, we just launched uh, the uh, cloud servers powered by OpenStack on 8.1. Uh, we do have a first-gen platform still where we were using Zen uh, 3. something. I think it was 3.2.1 or something or other. 
uh, initially, and then that platform was migrated to Zen Server uh, ahead of um, our next gen platform. Uh, we're using Zen Server 6, and we support VMs such as Linux, Windows, and FreeBSD. Um, so, total Rackspace has 180, over 180,000 customers. We don't break it out to cloud servers or uh, any other groups, but uh, to give you guys a, an idea of the scale that we're running Zen Server and cloud servers, we have tens of thousands of hosts running Zen Server, uh, hundreds of thousands of VMs, and millions of snapshots. Uh, why Zen? So um, probably the same reason most people use Zen, a very thin hypervisor layer, it's open source, um, great API, good performance. And a big thing for us was that um, since we also support Windows VMs as well as Linux and even FreeBSD, we're looking for the um, same virtualization technology to use for all of those. And um, Zen is just really the best thing for that. Um, Microsoft will support uh, Windows running under Zen, and that's uh, a good thing for our users. Um, so Zen and OpenStack, this is kind of a little bit more about the Nova Compute daemon, which runs inside uh, the DOMU that runs, under, runs on Zen server. John made a little bit of mention to that. And it, um, it's DOMU is a, you know, a utility DOMU. And it's, it's nice that it's separated fr out from DOM0. It's not sharing resources with DOM0. A little bit more secure in that regard and so forth. But uh, it, we attach, um, the images are attached to DOMU when we do things like resizes. Um, partitioning changes is a part of that. Uh, this daemon monitors the power state of all the VMs running on the host, so we can upstate, update the status in the database, so when people are querying um, Nova API, they're getting a correct state. Um, and snapshots and backups are support, uh, supported. John showed migration. And we're using an agent inside the VM that communicates through Zen Store, uh, which is uh, secure. So let's see. Um, some specifics just about OpenStack in general, Rackspace. Um, we run trunk code from app OpenStack. We're pretty much never uh, more than two weeks or so behind trunk. Um, we do have some custom patches that go on top of trunk. Um, some things that are really just not, not really, the, you know, the community doesn't really care about. They're not really um, appropriate for the community and whatever. And so we apply those patches on top of trunk. We have a custom scheduler and so forth. Um, so to run all of the OpenStack services, we actually virtualize them as well. So. We use Zen Server. I think I have a diagram on the next slide. Um, so things like the Nova, Nova API, uh, Nova Scheduler, uh, those types of services we actually virtualize as well and run under an OpenStack deployment. Uh, so I like to call this Inception. Um, so yeah, it's OpenStack on OpenStack, essentially. And the reason we do this is easy to spin up. If we need another scheduler and so forth, we can just bring up another scheduler real quick because it's all virtualized. Um, makes deployments very easy, and we can think about new ways of doing deployments as well because we can decide, well, it, this is all virtualized. We could actually just to, to upgrade, our, uh, upgrade our, our production software, we could actually just spin up new VMs running the new code, the new OpenStack code, and shut down, just shut down the old VMs. So, pretty cool. And a little bit of diagram about that, too. So we, call, we call that uh, infrastructure iNova, 
And so in the iNova environment, you can see we have Zen server hosts that are dedicated to running the public cloud infrastructure. Um, and then our Zen server hosts that are actually running our customer VMs and so forth are, are sitting outside of that. So as I mentioned, um, we have our custom branches, custom patches, and so forth. We pull in trunk daily, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, we unit test them and package up the code, and it automatically rolls through a, uh, a couple of different environments. We have a QE environment um, that runs the initial integration tests and so forth. And then after that, we have a, a pre-production environment. And uh, we use the same, pack the same packages that we've packaged up, roll, roll through all the environments. And after we've uh, run all the tests, done the QE environment, and sits in the uh, uh, pre-reduction environment for a while, then we roll, out that, roll that out to production. So yeah. I guess the next bit, I want, you know, just want to make it a bit more interactive and just open Q&A. Are there any questions or requests or anything in particular? Yeah, sure. Um, support probably right now. Um, it's a good question. We've been partners with Citrix for quite a while now. And, um, I didn't make the decision, so I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> but, uh, I, I don't think so. Pretty much, I mean, Zen Server is pretty much just. Yeah, so just from, from memory, the things that Zen Server has that aren't an XCP are things like workload balancing. Um, effectively, it's the stuff that need, uh, there's those service VMs that automatically start up for certain features. Um, they're not packaged uh, with the, the XC, with the with XCP. Uh, generally, you get most of the stuff in XCP. Uh, the XCP on Ubuntu, it's worth saying, is not feature complete with the ISO binary XCP. Um, so the, the tool stack that's in Ubuntu is frankly still a little bit of a work in progress. Uh, exactly, Project Chronos, the X XCP Zappy packages. Uh, fundamentally, they went first of, well, they sort of, first of all, went into Debian and actually got into Ubuntu released first. They're in 12.04 was the first release that got those. Uh, they're nice from a developer perspective so you can build stuff. Um, there's still work to be done there. We Patches were, welcome. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go we ahead. were also using, I know we were using Zen Server before XCP was, um, oh, yes, like it was a zero actually. dot. <laughs> I, I, it was a zero dot beta um, maybe shortly after we were even using Zen Server in the, in the first place, so. Yeah, th there's no way today of getting support on XCP, which is a unfortunate thing. Um, but yeah, if you want support, it's certainly Zen Server's the way forward right now. Uh, sorry, yeah. Yes, I think that's true. So the live migration with shared storage is in the free one, um, but that, that one isn't. There, yeah, there, there's kind of, um, there's, yeah, there's two, two ways to do live migration. Um, well, there's migration well, and there's live migration. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, are you still, is it still li live Zen motion? Uh, yeah, so so the, um, the storage motion storage basically motion. gives you migration, but without losing the downtime in the, so, it's probably worth knowing that it does, so the free Zen server, you can get Zen server for free, doesn't include uh, Zen storage motion, but XCP does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's the, the migration that I had on there is not really live migration. Um, the, um, yeah, there, when you resize VMs and so forth in OpenStack, there's, a, there's you typically uh, move the VM to another host 
And so, but the VM is shut down. Um, the disk is resized. Uh, I think it's resized after we are the R sync happens yeah. over to the other host. So yeah, yeah. migrations are resized where the size doesn't change yeah. <laughs> to a specific host, essentially. If I remember rightly, yeah. The, the, so the resize operation is actually not that. This well, the, the migration because you take a snapshot, you copy the bulk of the disk, and then you shut down and finally copy the last snapshot and coalesce on the other end. And it's an R sync over SSH, if I remember rightly. Yeah. Do that. Um, right. Yeah, both of the copies. Sorry, Neil. Yeah, so the question was, in the, if you're doing uh, the storage motion, live migration, and you're doing file IO, what on earth happens? So what happens is, um, in the case where, in the storage then motion case that I was demoing, when you press go on the, on, the, on the start of that, what happens is we take a snapshot. And that, that snapshot disk, the small disk, is synchronously mirrored between the two hosts. So any writes that happen, are actually ensured that they've persisted on both disks before that write's committed. And that, doesn't, that does imply a performance degradation during that process. Um, but that's what's done. Um, so that those two disks are kept in sync. And then once everything else, you know, once the, those base disks are fully copied, then the actual transfer happens. And there's sort of a small outage. And the, the outage is basically exactly the same as it would be with a pool-based live migration. It's fundamentally the same thing. It's just that the distance might be further for the memory copies that happen. Good question. Um, our ops guys would have done most of that. And since I'm on the development side, I'm not sure I have a great answer for you. Um, I know we. I, I know we've talked a lot with Citrix on, you know. There's a different things you can do. I mean, it's worth saying when you're deploying this stuff, you can Pixie boot Zen server. And that Pixie boot installation, you can actually inline supplemental packs that happen. And a supplemental pack is an RPM that runs after the install on the, on the DOM zero. And you can also have post installation scripts that run at certain points in that process, which does allow you to basically script all of that. Um, I mean, the Project Olympus that happened but never happened, um, that's exactly what we were doing to actually get that all working. You use the supplemental packs, and those supplemental packs can create the VMs and, and do all that automation. So if people are interested in doing that kind of thing, definitely get in touch, and we can help you through the process. Yeah, the only tweaks as far as performance and things I can think of on the host side of things in DOM0 is just... Uh, normal things like how much memory you give to DOM zero and, right. and all that. Number of CPUs, yeah. Uh, yeah, number of CPUs for DOM zero. Yeah, it depends on the workloads. So I know, for example, when you're running uh, Zen desktop on Zen server, generally the workloads, if on bigger boxes, you'll need to do things like have four CPUs running like two gig of RAM on the DOM zero. And there's, there's performance stats people can tell you about for given your, the stress that you're doing, what's the best thing to choose. I know there's some plans for auto-tuning and that kind of thing. There's some guys in the community working on that, but it's not got anywhere yet. And depending on if you're running, if you're doing HVM, like Windows VMs and so forth too, you might configure DOM0 differently than you would if you're just strictly Linux and so forth, because yeah, HVM the, requires QEMU to, to yeah, run for the, every domain. Yeah, device emulation yeah. Does, does add something there. A Zen client that runs on um, Linux or Mac OS. So Zen client, if I remember rightly, you can it. So supported wise, uh, Linux and Mac OS don't work. Uh, demo wise, if you look back in the keynotes, they actually made Zen client work with Mac OS. Um, that I don't believe has got anywhere. I think more for political reasons than anything else. I don't know for sure. And Zen client running. Um, Ubuntu and sort of that general stuff. It does actually work. It's not supported, but you can go and do that. Um, so I guess the, the, the genuine answer is is no, but you can do some of these some of these things do work. And the Zen client thing, it's probably worth saying, Zen server and Zen client. It's something that you, <laughs> bye. It's something that you install on the actual machine, 
it's not, um, it's not like you've got Ubuntu running on your machine, so you need an Ubuntu-supported Zen client. Um, the client bit is referring to being a client hypervisor rather than a server hypervisor. It's not like something you install in an OS. That makes more sense. Uh, yeah. In terms of if you're talking about a Citrix client for all those OSs, that's do you want to connect your Zen, AP, Zen server and Zen desktop to all those different clients? And the answer to all those is actually yes. So you can run that on Android and everything else. But that's probably a bit off topic. But I did actually used to work in that team. So. <laughs> cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, the quick answer is no. Um, so the, the, the classic availability, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not out of the question to add the support. If people are interested, we should look at this. What we added in, uh, whoa, we're over time a little bit. We added support for doing uh, pools recently. So you can actually set up a pool using the host aggregate concept, and that allows you to use uh, shared storage as your default thing. And then that would allow you to set attributes on those instances. So totally out, certainly out of band, you could actually set up the HA policies on that given you've got appropriate Zen server licenses and things. Um, and there was a design summit session on this back in, I'm trying to picture the hotel, must have been Boston. Um, yeah, but we haven't really gone down that route because there hasn't been requests for it. But if you're interested, then. It's all doable, uh, <laughs> says the developer. <laughs> it's just code. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's not there today, but it could be done. Cool, any more questions? This is good, because we're over time. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you.